How is it that the ICH sign-up doesn't allow question marks in the password? The ICH sign-up is one of the most broken things I've got. You want to fucking fight, Jack? Oh, the camera's <laughs> rolling, man. Uh, but the reason for that is because that's not a valid uh, character in the active directory password. Oh, you're going off active directory? Yeah, yes. Uh, <laughs> as much as we'd love to have whatever password you want. So. Yeah, totally. Did you guys ever fix the fact that I forgot my password just makes me can't walk into your account? I'm not kidding at all. Like I did, but I reset my password now none of them work. I walked aside and said, I didn't exactly do the special features. All right, so as much as I would love to sit here and complain about Ice Age for another hour or two, uh, at some point I need to start this presentation so that I can uh, finish this presentation and go take an exam. So if I start rushing, uh, that's why. I'll try and slow down. Anyway, hello. Uh, this is a presentation on physical security that I've given a number of times to ISG and various classes and groups and stuff. And uh, this time I've changed it a little bit because the last time it was like a two hour presentation that I condensed into 60 minutes, which was still too long. So we're gonna see uh, what happens here. Anyway, long story short, this is meant to just be a kind of whirlwind run through a bunch of really cool physical security concepts and tools and ideas and stuff. Um, just, if I find it cool, then I threw it in here and then I probably trimmed it out for time. Uh, and now it has like bonus case studies from my actual experience doing physical security assessments. So it's not just me stealing content from other people. I have uh, real stories of how one breaks into banks and stuff. Um, let's see. But none of that is important. I already said that. Uh, if you want to learn about physical security at all, in any capacity, these are two of the best sources in the world. There's Deviant Dalm, who is an incredibly nice dude all over Twitter and YouTube. He's been giving conference talks everywhere since the dawn of time. Uh, he does a lot of physical red teaming and penetration testing. Um, Really, a lot of stuff that I've learned, I've learned from him. Um, and then the open organization of lockpickers, they focus obviously more on lockpicking than on anything else, but they are pretty great. Uh, I don't, so Arden isn't here tonight, but if you ever meet Arden Meyer around here, he is the chap, the president, or the head of the local tool affiliate chapter, whatever it's called. Um, good person to know and to talk to about picking locks. Uh, so, standard. COA, don't break into things that don't belong to you, don't go, you know, break into an apartment complex somewhere and say ISG taught you how to do it. Because we've had cops and university people talk to us before about physical security talks and stuff like that. So do your best to be good law-abiding citizens. Um, and if you get caught, plead the fifth and don't say anything about me. Uh, now, it's not like I'm teaching you anything that is illegal or secretive or hard to find. Like literally just Google how do I pick a lock and you'll find a massive community online that is dedicated to learning how to pick locks with a sport in it. They call it lock sport. It's pretty wild. Lots of really cool high security locks that get, that get traded around with people showing off their skills by picking them and making them harder and picking them again. Uh, if you ever want to talk to me about that, I will talk about it for literal hours. Um, hands up, by the way, if you've ever like picked a lock or played around with that in any capacity whatsoever. That's awesome. I'm actually super happy to see like, a, a, a number of people have done that. Uh, everybody else, I encourage you to learn it at some point. Hopefully at some point this semester or next semester, I'll run a beginner's night on lock picking and actually have a little table of lock, easy locks and lots of picks that you can grab and uh, play around with. Uh, now, I cut the lock picking content out of this presentation for time because that was like 15 minutes. Um, so we're just going to jump into some fun ideas. Uh, bypassing locks is basically exactly what it sounds like. Lock, like with picking locks, uh, it takes time, it takes practice, you have to carry around lockpicks. Bypassing locks, you can just like do in fun ways because you know it's a lot like uh, photography stuff, right? You've heard, you know, uh, there but RSA is like mathematically sound, like crypto is mathematically sound, but the way that people implement it is where the problems show up and you can often, you know, break it, not by breaking the crypto itself, but by finding some way around it. So this is just a really good example of what bypassing a lock looks like. This is a, uh, a locked drawer. This drawer is, in fact, not openable. This drawer is openable and lets you just like pop it out and grab stuff out of the locked drawer. This is the basic idea behind lock bypassing. Even though that's a cheap way for lock, you could probably break it open in like 30 seconds tops. Uh, you can buy a CH751 key most likely and just pop it open, which more on that later. Um, 
you don't need to carry around a tool. Just pop the drawer out of the file cabinet and have access to whatever sense of disaster, to whatever sensitive thing is in there. So, you know, that's kind of fun. Uh, something totally unrelated. Let's talk about bypassing a lock by just popping the door right off the hinges, right? Anybody here ever install a door or replace a door or anything like that? So hinges just have a little pin that runs right through them vertically, right? Uh, these are pretty common in residential applications and a lot of commercial applications. Uh, you can take a nail and a hammer or take one of these fancy plastic tools that keeps your hands safe and set it underneath the hinges and whack it and pop the pin right out. At this point, you lift the door off the hinges, just set it to the side, and it doesn't matter how many locks you have on the doorknob, how many deadbolts are in there, the door is no longer attached on one side of the frame and you can just pop it out. Now that being said, security hinges exist, and these are pretty cool. You don't see them nearly as often as you should, but they're pretty cool. Basic idea, you have a peg on one side and a hole in the other. When those are put together, it doesn't matter if you pop the pin out, there's still just like something solid holding that together. And those screws right there are jam screws, which basically allow you to, if you don't have security hinges, but you want to make a door better, you unscrew this screw, you unscrew this screw, you unscrew this screw, you unscrew this screw. Uh, pop in the jam screws in these two holes, and nothing in these two. And magically, now when the door closes, there's going to be a little pin stuck in a little hole, and the door cannot be pulled out of the door frame. Um, more with open doors. So, uh, this is pretty common, and you know, you've know seen residential doors with this, and uh, you know, it's just a, it's a fairly standard design, but uh, anyone know what this little red thing does? Yes? Um, it prevents uh, bypassing the lock by just putting, like, pushing the white piece into the door, like the latch in. Yeah, so when the red thing, so the, the white thing is what holds the door shut, right? The white thing holds the door in the frame. That red piece right there uh, is what's known as a dead latch. The idea is that when that thing is depressed inward, it engages a little mechanical arm somewhere that will prevent the actual latch of the door from just being pushed inward. It can only be opened by twisting the doorknob and retracting it from inside. Now, most of the time, that dead latch is not installed properly uh, in that the hole in the door frame that the latch and dead latch are going into is too big or it's just not being pushed down far enough to engage the arm. So you can just slide, uh, oh, there we go. Um, that's, so that's where it is when it renders the latch dead and you uh, can't just push it in. Um, anybody here ever like pop open a door with a credit card or see someone do something along these lines? They actually make a fantastic little tool called the Hall Pass, Sparrows does. This thing is like five bucks, a little piece of stainless steel that allows you to do exactly that. Pop the door open on, you know, badly installed latches because, uh, you know, just slide in there, push the uh, latch open, and, uh, and you're in. Obviously this also works with things like credit cards, and I actually found that uh, this little piece of fiber, uh, or what is it, um, fiberglass, like printed circuit board, a really thin one, has just the right amount of flex to get around some tough uh, latches and doors and pop them open, which is a good bit of fun. Speaking of awkward transitions, electronic locks, those are kind of fun. Anybody know what this is right here? The hint is it's not an electronic lock. You don't get to say, because you know what it is. Okay, no, 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 you get to say. It's a Proxmark. Correct. This is a fun little device, the Proxmark 3 Rev 4, I think. Um, basically, it's a little $300 doohickey about the size of a cell phone, and it is capable of reading RFID chips and cards and the like. And it's also, also capable of writing to RFID chips and cards and the like. So you take one of those, you uh, walk up close to someone who's wearing a badge that'll let them badge into their workplace, uh, just brush up against them on a bus or something, copy the information off of their badge stored on the Proxmark, and then either burn it onto your own badge somewhere, or just carry the Proxmark up to the door and point it at the sensor, and you can just open the door. Because it turns out that's not a super secure way of doing things, and most people just go to the coffee shop from work with their badge hanging off their belt, so you can copy it and walk right in. Um, if you are interested in playing around with one of these, for, and I cannot stress this enough, legal and ethical purposes only, the I, uh, IASG has one of these, as well as a stack of blank RFID cards that you can play around with. We have a whole bunch of equipment, like uh, Proxmark and uh, software radios and stuff like that. Um, 
which, you know, if you ever want to play around with them, you're free to rent it from uh, the club for nothing whatsoever. The, the cost of the rent is that at some point you have to give a very brief presentation on what cool things you did with it. So if, say, you manage to take the Proxmark and read the fun little RFID tag that the buses on campus use to signal to the gates that, hey, I'm a bus and you should let me, uh, you should open the gate and let me through, and then you were able to write the bus to a card and then start swiping your card on, say, data centers around campus and, you know, pollute error logs somewhere with, uh, hey, Cyride 14 just tried to access, like, the basement of Durham. <laughs> I'm not saying you should do that, but I'm saying it'd be pretty hilarious. <laughs> Um, yeah, that picture has literally nothing, but I suppose you probably, this is exactly the kind of card that you've probably seen before at work or something like that. Um, here's a fun one. This might be my favorite. Anybody recognize one of these boxes? We have a hand. Okay, cool. These boxes are all over the place, and once you learn about this, you're going to start seeing them literally everywhere. They will haunt your dreams. These little boxes are made by Door King Systems. The uh, basic idea is that you install this outside of your apartment building, your office space, your whatever it is, and it allows people to get in in a number of ways. What's supposed to happen is a resident of the apartment or an employee of the building will walk up and either hold up an RFID card next to the black reader there, or punch in a PIN number, uh, something should work. There's also some call buttons on the bottom, which you can use if you're a guest and you need to call security out at like, you know, midnight to let you into the building or something. Um, Pretty straightforward thing. You'll notice that there's two areas on it that have uh, little keyways. Now, both of those are like reasonably, I, I guess I, I'm not going to make any judgment about how hard they would be to pick those locks. Uh, what's important to know is that this one right here, this keyway, uh, has the lock cylinder uh, installed by the people who own the box and own the building. So, and that is going to be typically a very you know, high quality lock, hopefully with a hard-to-find key that you know, only the building security manager has access to or something. Uh, and then, you know, idea is that they could necessarily use that key to uh, turn on a special feature of the box and just unlock the door. That other keyway on the top has a lock cylinder that is standard from the Door King factory with the same key on every single box which is kind of fun, uh, and that's a maintenance access thing. If you have that key, you can open this box up. And now you start looking around inside and say, well, that's a lot of Hollywood-looking electronic stuff, and frankly, electronic devices terrify me. Double E 201 was a nightmare, and uh, I'm kind of scarred by it. So if you like circuits, and you like doing stuff like this, awesome. Like, this tearing one of these apart could be a great project. If you're like me and you don't like tearing that stuff apart, uh, you can just grab this manual off the internet, which they publish, and look for uh, these relays right here, and then bridge them with a paper clip or something, and then trigger the uh, relays to fire, which will open the locks and open the uh, building. So that's all well and good, but uh, how do you get into that box in the first place? Well, it turns out that, uh, like I said, they, they ship with that same lock on top for maintenance purposes. And this video here is of Deviant Alum, who again, follow his YouTube channel and follow his content stuff and stuff. He's just talking about uh, you know, the features of the thing. You stick this maintenance key in, open it up. There's a little button that if you push the button, it will just fire every relay that that box has wired up, which will open every, or fire every solenoid connected to it, which opens every lock that the box is connected to. Now, this is obviously not like a high security installation, right? It's, a, it's an apartment complex. You could have just reached over that gate with like a stick and hit the handle on the other side and let yourself in. Like, this isn't four knots. But that being said, having the key to get in there made it a lot faster for them to uh, gain access. So, where does one acquire one of these keys? Excuse me while I acquire one of these keys. Okay. Um, right here. These, key, these, these keys can be found by searching for Door King 16120 key and paying $13 on the internet. Uh, and suddenly you just have access to like every Door King box. Like just all of them. It's possible to replace those things, but literally nobody does. So, that's kind of fun. If you have one of these on your, on your apartment, maybe you ask your landlord if they took the time to replace that because like that's a little spooky if they didn't. Um, moving on from there, anybody know what this is? 
Rec sensor. Yes, Rec sensor. Request to exit sensor. Basic idea is that it looks for humans. If it sees humans, it unlocks doors. These are a big part of fire code for things like server rooms. And you see them in office buildings a lot, honestly. Uh, basic idea is that you have them on the secure side of the door. If it detects a human walking toward it, it will unlock the door so the human can walk right out. Uh, that's useful for if you're in a secure environment, like I said, fire code purposes. So if everyone's running toward the door, they don't have to get out a badge or a key or something. Uh, it'll just open the door and let them push their way out. Um, it's also just used for convenience purposes because you know people have to badge into a building. They don't want to have to go badge out or push a button to leave or something. Um, no. So I don't have the video in here anymore. That's kind of fun. Uh, the important thing to take away from this is that they work based off of temperature. If they see something hot, they assume it's a human. If they see something really cold, they'll assume that it is cold air in between two humans. So what you can do is find yourself a can of canned air, which you might have used to clean out a keyboard or a computer or something like that. You ever turn one of those upside down and spray it, just this jet of freezing cold white you know, carcinogens or whatever it is in that can just fly out. Um, that's kind of fun to do to just like you know freeze the tiny things. Not that I'm advocating being dumb and freezing something important. But uh, you take one of those, you spray this freezing cold chemical mixture under the door, and the rec sensor will see it as cold air, assume that that's the air temperature in the room, and the hot spots on either side of people, and it'll fire and open the door for you. So that's kind of fun. Later, I will briefly talk about how I got caught trying to stick a can of canned air under the door of a bank. That was a good time. Um, Let's see. Oh, here's a bit of fun. Who would win between an expensive electronic lock, the deadbolt, reinforced strike plate, security hinges, or a drop ceiling tile? <laughs> Anybody know why these tiles are uh, need to be considered in your security model if you are trying to, if you're a systems administrator and you're trying to lock down your server room? The basic idea is after this presentation, I invite you all to come over here and look directly up above. This room is actually perfect because you can see that there's like a solid four feet at least of space between these drop ceiling tiles and the actual like concrete for the floor that's above us. Um, now that's typically filled up with pipes and electrical conduits and HVAC stuff, but there's still plenty of room to move around. And a lot of office buildings, if they just you know throw a server room in somewhere, they'll put a fancy lock door in place. They'll put a fancy lock on the door. They'll you know take all these steps to make sure that it's secure. But they don't like push a ceiling tile up and realize, wait a minute, this wall was just like built here and it only runs to the drop ceiling tiles. It's just uh, you can pop one of these up and out, crawl over the top of the wall and drop back in on the other side. This is the kind of thing that gets used reasonably like I mean not super often. That'd be just silly. But like, it shows up on Twitter threads about physical red teams and often enough that uh, you would think people would start making sure their walls run all the way up through the floor of the next ceiling, but they do not. Uh, let's see, tailgating. This is some fun stuff. General idea is that you just kind of follow people into buildings, and spoiler alert, that's what a lot of my case studies are going to turn into. Um, People tend to be nice, and they tend to hold doors for you, and they don't tend to want the conflict of turning around after they badge in and saying, hey, you also need to like let this door shut and then badge yourself in separately. No one does that. If they're badging into an office, one person will badge in and open the door and just you know, hold it for the next guy and so on and so on. And, you know, 20 people get in without having to swipe an ID. So if you just happen to like tag along with a group of people, it's pretty easy to walk into a secure area. Uh, bonus points if you have a bunch of food with you because nobody wants to be the person that denied like the Panera delivery driver or something access to the building because that's probably like food for a catered meeting or lunch or something and obviously I want to get some of that so yes Mr. Panera driver please come right into a secure building and I'll hold the door for you. Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. The possible solution of a man trap or airlock, just the general idea of you might have seen them in like I think the subway systems sometimes have them, but just a big, uh, not just a regular turnstile, but a big uh, metal grill thing with that have uh, arms that pass through each other so only one person can get in this little chamber and walk through at a time, which really slows people down and no one likes walking through those. So you, know, you don't see those pretty often in uh, most offices. Social engineering as an idea, this kind of plays into the Panera driver stuff, but you can just kind of walk around and look like you own the place and look like you're supposed to be there and no one will question you, just as a concept. Uh, hard head, 
excuse me, hard hat with a high vis vest and a clipboard, you are obviously a contractor because no one can just go buy those things from Walmart for like $15 and then just walk around pretending that they're doing work on stuff. So people let you just do whatever. Uh, elevator keys, you can buy those real easily. Um, granted, there's like a whole slew of problems that can come from messing around with elevators that end in like actual injury or that end in the fire department dragging you out of the elevator or you know just calling various emergency services to the elevator if you use the key wrong so you know maybe don't just jump right into trying that out um ladders if you're like no one has ever stopped someone carrying a ladder this is just a statement of fact ladders you are obviously there to do some kind of important work and no one will stop you um and then company clothing pretty easy to track down. Like I've just found branded clothing in thrift stores before and you know it's like oh 50 cents and I have the official tie of fairway stores in case I want to break into the stock room of a grocery store. Cool, that's worth 50 cents. Um, but I know I've seen stuff like CNN jackets that make you look like you're actually a reporter from CNN. They sell those in their headquarters in Atlanta in their gift shop. So you could just, or at least they did when I, I saw this picture online a while ago. Maybe they stopped because you know, they realized that that allows anyone to just look like there's some credential member of the press and walk around into areas where they probably should. Uh, here's a fun case study. This has nothing to do with uh, anything that I did. This is a story that I heard from a pen tester online. Uh, they were supposed to get physical access to the servers in a bank branch. So what they did is got a collared shirt, they grabbed a police badge from Walmart and spray painted it with like a shiny bronze color. They grabbed a two-way radio and a toolbox. You walk in, you say that you're a fire marshal, you have your buddy in the van making uh, just random radio chatter so it sounds like you're you know, hearing fire station uh, radio chatter. And you say, yes, I am a fire marshal and your bank is being randomly audited for fire code compliance. Now, what the bank should do, or the teller that he says this to should do, is get their manager who should like, call the fire department and verify that this individual is in fact a fire marshal, and then they should have an employee escort them around and do whatever check they need to do. What will actually happen, or what actually happened in this case, is the employee said, yeah, sure, go for it, go, uh, go audit. And so they just walked him around the building, walked him right to a server room, and I don't have the bullet point on here, but he has some great stuff from his write-up about how he got underneath the desks of every employee in the branch by saying, yeah, we need to make sure that the fan on the back of your computer isn't obstructed, so it's not going to get too hot and it cause a fire or something. I've never just seen like an old Dell Optiplex just burst into flames from a clogged vent, but he told it could happen, and they let him crawl under the desk and put a little sticker on the back of the computer saying, could have plugged a key logger into this. About a week, you know, after he's done with this whole assessment, he gets in contact with the hire up to the bank and hire him and they do their walkthrough and you know every computer in the bank all the servers in the back room like everything just has these little pink stickers on them that said i was here and you lose so that's kind of fun this is a case that is that was told to me by the president of a bank this did not happen to their bank it happened to a local competitor and this was not a penetration test this was 100 percent just some criminals doing criminal things so they they go into a bank branch right uh, they walk in, they, they have some tape, they have a little printed out 8.5 by 11 sheet of office paper that says, please leave this door unlocked, maintenance crew is coming in to do work tonight. They stuck it up on the inside of the door, and they left. And the tellers on their way out just didn't lock the door because they assumed, oh, corporate is sending like a maintenance crew to upgrade something or do whatever. So they walked in the front door, did whatever you do when you're unsupervised at a bank and you're a criminal, and then they got away. I don't know if they got caught later, but it just goes to show. People tend to just be helpful and do what you ask of them. And you know, if you manage to get a copy of the, you know, you're running a penetration test, get a copy of that company's official looking letterhead stationary stuff to make it look like a real announcement from you know, corporate compliance, something or other, then people will almost certainly listen. So that was my long-winded uh, run through of like a third of what my original presentation was plus those fun case studies. So now I have a little bit about my case studies from the summer, which I did not make slides for because I didn't realize I was speaking to them until very late. So, long story short, uh, this last summer, I, and at this point, I didn't say this at the beginning, 
at any point, if you have questions, please like interrupt me or throw your hand up or somehow like stop me because otherwise I will soapbox for literal hours. Uh, anyway, uh, the summer I was employed with a penetration testing consulting team. Did a lot of internal and external network penetration tests. Also had the opportunity to, opportunity to do some social engineering engagements where I'm sending off phishing emails, calling up companies, or calling up employees of companies and pretending to be either their corporate IT or some of us to interview them for some process, see if I can learn anything useful from them, and then also get to drive around to various bank branches and office buildings and let myself in in unconventional ways. Um, the general overall thesis of this part of the presentation is that all of the cool stuff I told you is like really cool, valid things you can do, but honestly, tailgating is like the way you get literally everywhere. Like the, every bank that I got into, with the exception of one, was done by just following someone through a locked door, and they helped me perform it. And then you know, once you're inside a bank's corporate office and you're wearing what you know, like a, a jacket and uh, slacks and stuff, people assume that you're just an employee of the bank. So there's. Uh, one particular case study, or one case that was not that, which uh, I want to highlight. Um, and this, I think, goes to show that a little bit of preparation goes a long way, uh, especially since I had no time for preparation for this job. The long and short, uh, the summary of it is that I was told at approximately 10 a.m., hey, we need, to do, we need you to do a walk-in at this bank branch at 1 p.m. Uh, I had never heard of the company, I hadn't been assigned to their stuff before, but I got in the car with my coworker, went out uh, to the branch, he walked around, the case of the place, came back, told me what the layout was like, how many people were working there. Uh, I didn't have any you know, supplies with me to put together a convincing disguise of any kind. I just had my usual, I think, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't this hoodie, it just some, you know, basically looked the way I always do, right? Um, just kind of the unkempt student who puts no care into his appearance. Uh, I had this, I had my backpack with a laptop and a bunch of ethernet cable and just whatever I carry around on a regular basis. So we decided the way that I was gonna go in was by pretending to be from corporate IT. And so I you know, walk in the front door of the bank and go talk to a teller and tell them, you know, I'm Jack from corporate IT and there's been weird traffic coming off your guys' network and I need to go plug in in the server room and check it out, which they, rightfully said, no, uh, we're going to talk to our manager. Grabbed the manager, talked to them, and, and uh, uh, she looked a little suspicious, which was good. I got hit with a number of questions, including uh, Kevin, who was their corporate IT guy, uh, did not say that anybody was coming to our bank branch. So, uh, you know, so I had made something up along the lines of, nope, uh, this was a weird thing that came up overnight, and he's been swamped, so he didn't make any calls. She goes down an employee roster because it's a small regional bank and sees that you know my name is not on the list and says you are not an employee of this bank. Why are you? What are you talking about? Um, made up some nonsense about being a summer intern, and finally she said, "Well, I'm just going to call Kevin and verify if this is okay." This is the part where I was pretty sure I was going to be leaving in handcuffs, and I, before she could you know grab her phone and make the call. I said, oh, I have, uh, I've got Kevin's number pulled up right here if you want to just call him like, on my phone. She said, no, I'm not going to call him on your phone. I'm just going to call him here. And I said, well, do you want his number at least? And long story short, that's why, that's how she ended up calling my coworker who was sitting outside of the car and asking, hey, Kevin, uh, did you send Jack here today to do some, some weird testing? Actually, she said Josh, which was a fun thing. She forgot my name. And then my coworker nearly said no. Um, Anyway, they say, yep, uh, yeah, this, I am in fact Kevin, you have in fact called my cell phone, and I did in fact send Jack to test your network. And that was pretty much the end of it. After she heard that, I was given more or less the run of the place, which consisted of her setting me down in an empty office, plugging into their network, running some NMAP scans just to generate traffic so they could see I did you know, plug in there. And then just kind of decided to start testing the boundaries by standing up and walking out of the office I was told to work in, and just started walking around other people's offices. And it turns out, if you're carrying a laptop just kind of cradled in your arm and a bundle of Ethernet cable, and you just look like you're typing away furiously because, oh, there's some magic <coughs> Wi-Fi demon something here, and I'm going to find it yet, people just kind of assume that you're supposed to be there, and they didn't follow me. Uh, so this is how we ended up in the uh, 
uh, various offices of important people. I think one of them was like a president level something or other. They had a very nice office. They had very good candy too, which I did not, definitely did not steal the camera. Um, um, in the mail room of the bank, a records room, safe deposit room, basically just walk around everywhere pretending to be there. Um, this was one of the more successful stories of uh, this bank, or uh, the banks in general. Um, if, so obviously this would not have worked if, you know, one thing had been different, that is she had looked up the number of their uh, corporate IT guy on, you know, her own phone directory, right? That's the, uh, the big takeaway from this, is that if you are an employee of a company, somebody's trying to tell you that they are supposed to be there for whatever reason, just don't believe anything they say until you verify with, you know, against knowledge that you know is good. Uh, same thing goes for like general uh, UX design, right? All user input is evil. Yes. What would have happened if you got caught? Thank you so much for asking this. So, um, if you get caught on a physical pen test, there is a very specific uh, thing that you are always supposed to have on your person, which is your work order slash letter of authorization. So. Long story short, obviously, you know, we're hired by the uh, CISO of the bank. Usually it's a CISO, sometimes it's, I'm not even going to try and get into how the corporate office things work. Basically, some higher, some higher up at the bank uh, hires you to conduct this test, right? And obviously, they don't go telling everybody about it because that would be the point. So, you have a letter that the CISO will type out and sign that says, this employee is going to be breaking into this building at this address at this time on this day, and if you catch them, please do not send them to jail. Uh, call me, I will pick up, and I will like vouch for them. And they are contractually obligated to you know, be standing by their phone to pick it up and immediately verify that you were in fact hired to do it. Which is like a, it's still a little nerve-wracking because the times where I have been caught and had to get the letter out have been a little scary because you don't know if they're going to believe that if this you know just teller at a bank has ever heard of penetration testing as a concept. Um, fortunately, never had the police call on me or been like dragged out of somewhere in handcuffs. Though it's not unusual for that kind of thing to happen. Um, I might love to soapbox about the Dallas County stuff for a little bit. Sure, no time. Helpful. Oh wow, we're going. Okay. Um, <laughs> Long story short, for the Dallas County stuff, if you're not aware, two pen testers were arrested in the Dallas County Courthouse shortly after, or short, around midnight. They had a letter saying, we are supposed to be here, that was signed by some important person that works in the state of Iowa, and due to some local politics meets state, uh, I guess politics, it's not really political, but um, the, the sheriff of Dallas County said, I don't care, you're still under arrest, which, Granted, like, I kind of see that happening if he just didn't believe this letter was real and it's after midnight. The appropriate thing to happen is the next day when they call the state and say, hey, you know, vouch for us and let us go. Uh, the sheriff's supposed to let him out of jail. That did not happen. It's been devolving. Look up the coal fire pen testers, Dallas County, and read about that. All the documents, the redacted versions of the documents have been made public and they're kind of interesting to read. But, um, yeah, that, that's just an aside. Basically, you carry around your letter of authorization at all times. When I'm going, I always have like four copies of it, right? I've got one in my back pocket, one in my jacket pocket, one uh, out in my car in the parking lot, and a digital copy on my cell phone. So that, you know, if somebody is like getting twitchy because I have just, I'm like an intruder in a bank, I can just say, you know, just grab it out of my pocket, or here you can take my phone and look at it. Like, I'm just going to stand here with my hands in plain view for as long as it takes for you to decide that I am not, in fact, some kind of threat. Um, which tends to work fairly effectively. I've never had someone doubt the letter uh, to the extent that they still called security or called the police. Um, the thing that I was talking about earlier with getting caught with the uh, canned air under uh, a door, that was very much a time where I had to pull a letter because long story short, walk into a corporate office or a bank, uh, look around, some employee immediately walks over to me and asks who I am and what I'm doing there, which, she did it like friendly, like it was supposed to be like a customer service oriented. Hi, who are you and what can I help you with? Uh, but I still, you know, freaked out a little. Made up some nonsense about, oh, my dad's in a meeting upstairs, the loan officer, I'm just not hanging out here waiting for him to give me a ride home. Um, so once she goes back to her desk, I sit down in the lobby for a little while and then take off, hide in the bathroom, wait till she has 
uh, left her desk, and then just speed walk across this entire bank to uh, an area where I know there's stair the extra the door to the stairwell. Uh, thinking I can get downstairs, trigger a rec sensor, and escape. Um, about ten seconds after I entered the stairwell and got downstairs, I heard people running in the stairs up above me, and someone shouting, "He's not up here!" And the stair the footsteps start coming downward, um, which ended poorly. I made up something about how I was a contractor who was checking the part number off of hinges because we were going to be retrofitting the door with security hinges. They did not believe that and <laughs> escorted me to the front of the bank where I got to pull out a letter and make my case for why I shouldn't be arrested. Um, I will say one of the best things that come out of that day though was I you know, had a can of canned air, but it would look a little suspicious just carrying that around into a bank. So I stopped at a Casey's on the way there, got one of those big cans of Monster, locked the bottom of it off with a pocket knife, and put the canned air inside the Monster can, which then got taped back together with duct tape inside the can, so it looks like I was just walking around with an energy drink, which is substantially less suspicious. And I was pretty proud of that one, not gonna lie. I did have to ditch that when they were starting to start running down the stairs, and it became a whole thing. Um, uh, could someone use a fake uh, letter to try and Get inside? Yes, which is why what the letter says basically consists of A, like don't freak out, this is a test, and B, call this number right now to verify that it's a test, and it's an internal number to the CISO or CIO or whoever it is that ordered this thing, right? There is a great case that Christopher Hadley has. Uh, follow him, by the way, on Twitter and stuff. He's got some good content on so great content on social engineering. He was on a physical assessment, I'm paraphrasing for what I remember. Uh, where he it was a very secure facility, and he, there was one way he might be able to get in the door, but he would be caught by a guard right away. So he took this uh, letter of authorization that they gave him and made his own fake letter of authorization. It was more or less the same, but the number for the VP that they were supposed to call was replaced with a fax number. So the and then there's the last paragraph, which consisted of you know just take this person to the front desk and they'll wait for you know security for someone to come collect them it was replaced with take this for once you've caught them make this call then take him to an internal conference room and he's just going to do some internal pen testing of the network and just kind of let him do his thing uh, and i've also said like get him a, a, a visitor badge or something too i can't remember but he walked in got caught immediately gave them this fake letter that says hey you're such a good guard you did a good job catching this bad guy uh, call this fax number, the guard calls it, obviously can't get through because it's a fax. And says, well, they're not picking up their phone. And Chris says, all right, well, I mean, I think the letter says I'm supposed to just go to a conference room now and hang out or something. So the guard takes him along to a conference room, maybe gives him a guest badge or something, and leaves him alone to do his thing. So he just plugs into the network and starts breaking into stuff. Um, so yes, that you could have a fake letter. and. You should probably not just uh, try and do that in some secure facility. Um, this dude has literal decades of experience and knows way more about it than I do. Uh, that feels like a pretty risky play, if you ask me. Potentially getting caught, but it's something. Um, yeah, those are more or less the two more interesting or noteworthy or worth mentioning case studies from the summer. There's other stuff that was basically just tailgating people around. And the, the biggest thing, honestly, the, the biggest two things I can tell you, if you want to do physical pen testing just as a concept, are one, take an improv class or something, or like just do something improv -y related because people tend to have it. If people do ask questions, you, and you know, your, the story that you may have rehearsed doesn't exactly add up for why the Panera's delivery guy is in a server room, you might need to find some way to spin your way out of that, which, I mean, I've had stuff where I, I was caught in an office that uh, I was not supposed to be in, and the guy said, you know, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I was just looking for uh, Kevin, who looks like he works here, but uh, he's not here right now, so I'll just take off and I'll catch him later, and the guy says, actually, I'm Kevin, what are you doing in my office? Let's talk. And so I made up this whole thing about how I was a student who was friend with an intern at their company, and I was there to interview him for a project I was doing for a club organization, something or other, on campus. And I sat down and interviewed this guy, knowing nothing about him or what his job was or really anything whatsoever. As he's clearing off his desk so we can sit down and talk, I'm looking around his office, 
frantically trying to find a diploma or a certification or a conference badge or just anything on the wall that would give me some idea what the hell this guy does for his day job. And it is just fair, there's nothing. So I end up just kind of goading him along with really open-ended questions until he eventually says, yeah, I'm like a customer relations something or other. And then I start interviewing him about that and make it feel like a real interview for 10 minutes. And then I say, all right, Kevin, you've helped me more than you can possibly know. I'll see myself out. I got another meeting. I got to go meet, go, uh, go make it. And he took off and he didn't stop me. And I got out without getting caught. So improv is like a big thing. <laughs> and the other thing is, uh, you know, a lot of it is actually just tailgating. There's substantially less, you know, mission impossible dangling from ceilings and picking locks and safe cracking. But, like, there is some room for that in real physical red team engagements, which is pretty awesome. Anyway, I said I was going to do this in, like, half the time of last time. I've gone, like, substantially past that. So, anybody have any questions? Anything? Statements? Comments on how I should never give a presentation again? Because clearly I don't know what I'm doing. Which company did you work for? I worked for RSM, which is a fun place. If you see them at the career fair, talk to them. They do tax audit consulting stuff. Obviously, I'm on the consulting side. Um, you know, real fun, real entertaining place to work. If you like doing pen testing, if you want to have a chance to lie to people on the phone all day, if you want a chance to break into banks. Oh, where were you at first? Um, like, where was I based out of? Yeah. So I, technically, I was based out of the Des Moines office, but um, all of these physical security jobs and like internal pen tests and stuff like that are all over the place. So they would say, you know, hey, you have to fly out to XYZ next week and go break into an office and then stick around for a week to do an external pen test or an internal pen test. So you, awesome, cool. Go get on a plane and spend uh, a couple nerve wracking hours thinking of how can I sound like I get like I've lived in, you know, St. Louis my entire life when clearly I know nothing about the city. I put together a, a pretext and have my deputy go, go do the thing. It's good fun. Highly recommend talking about the career fair or like just or something. I'm not here to shill for them, but like it is. Anyway, no further questions. Uh, you can buy the CNN jackets. You can still. They are fifty-seven ninety-nine. Fifty-seven ninety-nine. You look like an accredited member of the press, and I'm just saying, if you had a badge that says "press" on it, has like your picture and some stuff, like who's really gonna grill you about? It? Are you actually like supposed to? Be? You can't print your picture on a piece of paper. Oh, okay. So here's something I, I said I was going to be done, but I'm not going to be done. So, uh, it's your Iowa State student IDs, those fun little badges that have a plastic card, that have a mag stripe thing on the back, and then RFID inside, and then, you know, colorful printing of your face and your student ID and stuff like that. You can buy the printers that make those cards on eBay. I know someone who just bought two for, like, less than $120 a piece, and then bought a bunch of cards that you could make with them. Um, yeah, basically, if, if you want to uh, look like you belong somewhere, you can get a good picture of somebody's uh, company badge somewhere, and you walk past them on the subway or something and scan their badge and copy that on, you could, you could really just become an employee of another company, which is something that does happen in this, uh, the world of physical red teaming and physical net testing. Not something that I did a lot of since it was mostly low security places, but uh, yeah, fun stuff. Anyway, thank you all for dealing with my rapid-fire nonsense. I appreciate the no one yelling at me the entire time. Uh, I think that is, oh wow, I literally had another page. Long story short, if you don't know why physical security is a big thing, this is why you don't want people breaking into your server. If you've never done anything security related before, uh, if I have physical access to a server, I'll hand it and ask you things to happen. So companies have a vested interest in not letting criminals get there. And there's, these slides will be online with these links to people's Twitters and videos and subreddits and everything that's worth checking out. Anyway, that's my time. Thanks for tolerating me. It's been wonderful.